Hey all you heroes, hawks, heralds, crows, pirates, and wardens. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we unpack, discuss, and galaxy brain about all the lore behind the Dragon Age series. We are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe, from character deep dives to exalted marches and elven gods. We will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age lore cast, where we're here to talk about Dragon Age and its lore. I'm one of your hosts, Austin, also known as Teacup, and I'm here with my other host, and we are here to start our season seven. That's right. Um, I'm Shelby or Sheikup if you're tuning in for the first time, and I am kind of shocked. Like, we're at season seven. We've been doing this for over two years now, like... That's crazy to me, Um, but I'm really, really excited for this season because we're talking all about elf, elven, everything, which you may have guessed um, from our Dragon Age Day episode. It was a little bit of a hint since we started with an elven like roundtable panel discussion, which is something that you know, I've wanted to do for a long time. And so I know that we've done some Elven overview episodes like, okay, here's one episode about all the Elven gods. Um, Here's one episode about the Dalish. But during this season, we're going to go really, really in depth. Like each God is going to get their own episode. We're going to talk about some cultural stuff and all of our character deep dives will be different elves from the series. Yeah. That's really exciting. Yeah, so I know, I mean, if you're not an elf simp, you may not find it as interesting, but I do, I guarantee that you will learn something, even if you're not an elf simp, and that I'm sure something will be relevant for Dragon Age Dreadwolf if we ever get that game. (laughs) Right, if and only if. Today, we are starting basically from the top with Elgernon, who is kind of seen as like the all father, like Odin, God, like the main god of the Evanuris, the elven pantheon. So we're just going to jump right into Elgernon. Um, Before we get into some fun facts and trivia, though, Austin, do you have any preliminary thoughts about Elgernon and who he is? The only thought I have comes from our very, very brief overview of the Elven Gods, like back in our first season, like our fourth episode or something like that. I remember him being in there of like the Dalish almost being like Elgernon is not really a name that you invoke. It's not someone you pray to. So that's all I know. Well, there are a few exceptions to that, but generally I think that that is true. So let's just dive right in. Um, the first thing I want you to know, as far as trivia goes, is that Elgernon has an association with the sun, like in the sky, the shiny, hot sunburn, that all of that. Um, but we'll we'll talk about his association with the sun later in the episode. But the trivia aspect here is that there's a bow that you can find in the Trespasser DLC named Elgernon Anaste. And if you put an elemental rune in it, elemental like you know the sun your attack all of a sudden just hits six times harder isn't that interesting it is interesting also also fun fact um the elgernon anaste bow name technically translates to elgernon's favor and so this is the description elgernon sun's death burn the ground under your gaze Grant the fire blessing. Your people call out for all things to end in flame. Ashes sing your praise. Interesting. I thought it was very interesting, um, specifically the grant the fire blessing. Like, I want to know more about what that is. Uh, Is that something the Dalish can and have received? 
just very curious about all of that. This is a little gamey and more about game mechanics than lore. But for those of you who might not have found the bow that Shelby was mentioning, it has an ability called explosive arrows, which basically causes a fiery explosion when you use it. Uh, It triggers a small radius of an explosion. But what makes it so interesting is that it's 100% weapon damage. So whatever your weapon damage of the bow is, is going to be doubled by that fire resist by that fire. So like if you have an enemy that is weak to fire, like say frost dragons, it's going to be exponential. Yes. But what happens is that each time one of those hits, when a rune is activated, it triggers the rune. So you're doing double rune damage on top of, the already doubled damage. So I just wanted to, for our friends who are big gamers and stat wise, I thought that would be an interesting thing to share. Okay. I, yeah, I don't care about any of that. I, it it shoots the arrows. Good for me. I'm cool with that. Like that's all I need. Um, But anyway, so my, I have one more fun fact and that is that in both origins and inquisition, There is a codex entry about Elgernon, interestingly not in Dragon Age 2, but this codex entry in Origins and Inquisition is the exact same codex text, but it has two different names. In Origins, the codex codex is named Elgernon, God of Vengeance, while in Inquisition, the codex is named Elgernon, the Allfather. I feel like this is a really big difference. And I'm curious what you think this change or difference in titles suggests. This might be kind of a result of, for lack of a better word, that Dragon Age writers trying to lean more into the Dalish and Elven association with Norse mythology. Because I know that they took a lot of critiques from early on when they were comparing them to other cultures well i mean i I don't think it's fair to argue i mean and i don't think you're saying this explicitly but your statement implies that like the norse culture the scandinavian cultures are not lived by real people and they are i mean there are people who do believe in the norse gods yeah that's that is true and i did not mean to say that at all and so but what i was saying is that um more oppressed people's Mm -hmm. critique for more oppressed people's and so maybe they're like well you know Let's just lean into this comparison. And so calling Elgin on the all father kind of does that. But it's really interesting because obviously, and let's talk about this, like Odin is the all father in Norse mythology, but it's really interesting to me that he has war, battle, victory, and frenzy associated with his like domains of influence. Odin does. Odin does. Yeah. Which you might throw vengeance in there, but I you can't mention vengeance without me talking about a certain uh, DA2 companion. So I think that's really interesting. I think it really is just Bioware trying to lean more into the association with Norse mythology. I think that there is um, something to be said for the way that Inquisition takes everything we thought we knew about the elves and turns it on its head. And so for me, knowing that, knowing that that was their mode of operation and and frankly still is, it makes me wonder, like, is this a precursor to learning something else about Elgernon or even the rest of the Evanuris? Is this a precursor to to Elgernon's, uh, what we know about him, being turned on its head. And frankly, I think it's possible. I think it's also possible that he stays exactly the same as he's been portrayed so far and he just continues to be consistent. But I do think that just from a literary standpoint, this change indicates at least the developers or someone, some writer somewhere wants us to look at Elgernon in a more benevolent light. Whether or not 
they're thinking about it explicitly like that. I don't know. And whether or not there's even a reason for that, I also don't know. But just on the basis of, okay, first he's the God of vengeance and he's the all father. Even if all father is associated with Odin and we know that Odin is not necessarily a, a benevolent God, the word father is going to make us think of those benevolent gods. I think in modern kind of context, like we think of Odin, like Odin in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I am only speaking of the cinematic universe, not the larger Marvel world. Odin is like flawed character, but he's not a bad character. Like he makes mistakes, but he's not necessarily evil. a selfish character or evil where like in certain interpretations of Norse mythology, you could very much see Odin as selfish or evil or manipulative. Mm -hmm. I just last thing is that it's interesting because early on in Dragon Age, they really wanted us to think about the relationship between justice and vengeance. And I'm talking about the actual ideals, not the spirit. And so I think it's interesting. I know we'll talk about this later, so I don't want to hit on it too much. But the pair that is married are goddess, are god and goddess of justice and vengeance, implying that similar connection that these two things are really two sides of the same coin. Or rather that they can be separated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of places that we can go with that. But for now, I think those are really great thoughts. But let's get into kind of Elgernon's general overview. So like many gods, he's known by many names. And this is kind of a pattern uh, before we really get into it. This is a pattern we'll follow throughout this series. Like we're going to we're going to talk about names. We're going to talk about their role, their relationships. We're going to talk about their temples and shrines and the Valisleen. And then we'll talk about in-world, in-universe folklore and beliefs about them. So we'll follow this pattern throughout um, when we can. I know that there's some where we just don't have the information. But anyway, so back to Elgernon. Um, for his names, he has many of them, perhaps the most. So some of the names, at least as far as what we know currently, um, he is known by the Allfather, the eldest of the son. He who overthrew his father mm. and God of vengeance. If you take those middle two and put them together, he who overthrew his father and the eldest of the son. So that means that the son is Elgernon's father, which means that Elgernon either destroyed or overthrew or won something against the son. We'll get into that in a little bit, but those are the basic names. Do you have thoughts? There's a lot of pulling and mishmashing of different mytho world mythologies coming in here. And I just think that's really interesting, but I don't want to sidetrack us. So let's okay. just keep going. Okay. So Elgernon is also, in addition to the names, he's also associated with rage, fury, and vengeance. And he is who you call upon for retribution and revenge, notably not justice, which we will talk about later and next week. Um, so what are the roles and relationships that Elgernon has amongst the Evanuris specifically? Along with Mithal, he is the leader of the Evanuris. Elgernon and Mithal are the two main members of the Evanuris. They are seen as the parents. We will get in over the next couple months to talking about whether or not they literally are the parents or if it's just figurative. Suffice it to say at this point, we don't know. You can make pretty solid arguments for either, um, but that is how they are seen regardless of whether or not it's literal. So Elgernon is like the angry dad of the Evanuris pantheon. Um, in addition to that, he also has a very strong connection to both the sun and the earth. And that's because in Elven Legends, the sun, Elgernon's father, was jealous of Elgernon, actually, because Elgernon had a very, um, very serious affinity for the earth and the plants of the earth and the animals, all the things of the earth Elgernon loved. And so the sun intentionally burned the things of the earth in order to get back at Elgernon. 
And so in retaliation, the codex says, Elgernon threw the sun down from the sky. So that is kind of how he wins or overthrows his father, so to speak. And the only reason that Elgernon did not completely destroy the sun, get rid of it from the from Thetis entirely, is because Mithal stopped him. So that's kind of the the short little story there, really quickly. Go ahead, Austin. So I've got a lot about this. Um <laughs> because okay. so as you may or may not know if you're kind of new to this podcast you probably don't know because you haven't both shelby and i have uh graduate degrees in religion and so we spend a lot of time we've talked about the bible and other like religions and mythologies um so there is this type of literature in the bible that's called a pop- apocalyptic literature and it very much is a style of writing. It's very complicated. So I'm giving a very like bare bones definition or summary. But a lot of times you will tell a story as if it's either happening in the future or happening in the past. And you use very obvious symbols that would be obvious to the people that you're writing this to. I really think that this is really coded if you read it from that lens the sun is the chantry and the earth are the elven people in the dales we don't know when this myth develops um or what it happens and i don't think that bioware would intentionally create a world that complicated but i think it's interesting like how that bleeds in and that you can interpret this as like because like the dale is very much view themselves as people of the earth and like the sun the sunburst is such a symbol for the chantry i just find it interesting these parallels that come in there yeah i think that's fair and i I think the metaphor maybe falls apart a little bit when you ask like okay so then did the chantry create the avenuris because it said that the son is Elgernon's father, you know, so that mm-hmm. that gets a little bit murky. But I think that you have a really salient point because the reality of myths, mythology, creation myths specifically is that they're interpreted through the lens of the people group who created them. And so for the Dalish, for the elves, I think it would make sense that they would want to latch on to something that encourages them to tear down the chantry or not even to tear it down, but to resist the chantry because the chantry is like, it is oppressive. It is all encompassing um, to the elves, especially the elves of the Dales when, when the Dales was, you know, falling was still around. Um, So I I think that there is something there. It's not just a completely off the wall theory uh, like you normally bring us. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, and you bring up a good point about that. It's not a perfect metaphor. Um, but when you're trying to adapt things, it's never going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like one of those interesting coincidences. And this is off topic. But like the Hebrew word for evil is raw. And as my Hebrew teacher told me, there's no connection between the Egyptian God and the Hebrew word. But it's just too much of a coincidence for me to ignore Mm -hmm. to ignore yeah absolutely yeah for sure so um let's talk about temples and shrines for a little bit so the constellation solium which is also referred to as the sun um was said to originally represent elgernon and elgernon was believed to have been able to wield fire lightning as well as the power of the sun even to kill his enemies And he is quite well known for burning his enemies and turning them into ash. According to the description of the robes of the High Keeper from Dragon Age Inquisition, the largest temple built in old Halam Sheral, so not the one you can go to in Inquisition, but the old city before the Dales fell, that largest temple built in, in old Halam Sharal was a temple dedicated to Elgernon, which I find very interesting because the biggest temple, and of course, like the main two gods are going to have the biggest temples, but I think it's really interesting that the place that the elves were forced 
to march to they were forced to retreat and give up their original homeland their new homeland the capital of that new homeland its largest temple is dedicated to the god of vengeance i feel like that's a middle finger to the chantry to venter and all human culture and thetis yeah i i a hundred percent agree and then again we get into this another kind of like mythology thing getting in here um a lot of time when a group is oppressed and they develop their mythology around that they will develop uh mythologies that tear down their oppressors but not only that but like turn the power that their their oppressors think they have and say no really our people have that and like this is a point of the 10 plagues in egypt like each one of them represents an egyptian god that the writers of the old testament are saying no the god of jacob and all this is stronger than these gods this is the god that's actually in control um, and I think we get another thing about this, like this co-opting of the sun and I'm kind of clinging to the sun as the Chantry metaphor a little bit. So I'll stop after this. But I think that like the idea of like, no, like you all view this sun and the sunburst throne, but our God and the one we're dedicating this temple to is the one who really wields this power and will burn our enemies with yeah, I think that that's absolutely fair as well. Um, but I do have two more like shrines, temples, whatever you want to call them, um, to Elgernon to talk about. And the other one we can find in game is um, called Elgernon's Bastion, which is kind of a kind of a neighborhood in the Emerald Graves. And then lastly, um, we learn about via Codex a monument in ancient Arlathan that it was said to be commemorating one of Elgernon's victories in battle, and it commemorated his status as, quote, first among the gods. And um, the Codex says that thousands of slaves made this statue in one afternoon and that it was made from a huge lump of stone. And so the statue was stern in appearance and had light coming out of the angry eyes, which I think suggests that the statue was made in the image of Elgernon. Like it was a, a bust or a statue of him. And um, it's, it's interesting because it, the statue itself proclaims Elgernon to be first among the gods when like all of the other literature we have says that Mithal and Elgernon are first among the gods, not Elgernon alone. So I think that that's an interesting, interesting take of the statue makers, whoever they may have been. I just sometimes am impressed. And this is, I, you know, I, I'll give it to them when they have it. I'm impressed with Bioware's writers sometimes and like their ability to create such a realistic religion, like one that's not just you know, cliches and all this, but like has nuance and is very real, which tells to me that either their writers are religious or they've got really good consultants. Yeah, I just also wonder like how much of it is just a, they lucked into it or it's a coincidence or, or right. what have you. Um, but anyway, so let's just talk about one more thing before we go to our mid break, which is the Valisleen that's associated with Elgernon. Um, we have two types from Dragon Age Inquisition. And we have a complex type and a, a simple type. And so um, for, I guess you would say the this one, the first type is the complex. But basically it has vines growing all over the face, starting from the chin, separated into one on each cheek, and then coming up and combining on the forehead. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have an alternative version where it's the same thing. But one side is like I just described, and then the other side is a blackout tattoo, and the vine is created in the negative space that has not been tattooed. So those are the two um, types of Valisleen that Elgernon has, and I think that it's really, really interesting when we think about the literary aspect, everything we've just talked about, everything we've known about Elgernon, being a god of vengeance, being harsh, being strict rage raging furious all of that it makes sense to me from a literary perspective that this valisleen for servants or slaves of elgernon would be one of the most intense ones you can get i also and to add that i find it really interesting the duality or like the almost the paradox of 
one side being ridiculously covered and the other side not really at all. And I think that really kind of shows a little bit of maybe that God of Vengeance and All Father are both true. Mm -hmm. And that Elgernon in his complexity and in his leadership and in everything really is both compassionate and vengeful. How that interplay works, who knows? But, you know, DAI, Dragon Age Inquisition, really kind of emphasizes this idea that these ideals that spirits represent are really two sides of the same coin. There's more connection between wisdom and pride than people really want to admit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. All right, well, let's uh, let's take a break and then we'll come back and talk about how the Dalish see him. So you like to read? What's wrong with that? It's frivolous. There are more important things for me to do. That's just her favorite. Nobody asked you, Tavinta. <laughs> I couldn't finish the last one you lent me. I actually feel dumber for having tried. It's literature. Smutty literature. Whatever you do, don't tell Varric. Mm, no offense, but might I try? I've got a quick hand, after all. Ha, let's see. Oh, when was the last time I slipped my hand into some dark hole? Hmm. I remember a long story, that. You hurt my head sometimes, Solus. Yes. I have been known to do that. Well, welcome to the middle of the show, and... Once again, just welcome to season seven. Um, we're very, very excited about this season. Um, we've got some guests coming up, too, that we're very excited about. Um, if you like to come hang out with us, support us, a great way to do that is to join our Patreon. Um, this month's patron chat, which will be recorded on December 14th, it's going to be a game show and all levels of patrons are invited. So if you want to sign up anywhere from our first level tier, which I think is $5 to our $20 tier to or however much you want to do, you can come on that show and come and play our game with us. And it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, plus, we'll be unveiling new merch for 2024. Um, if you have been receiving our stickers, we have more stuff incoming. Also, you'll be able you've probably seen it since our Dragon Age day giveaway is over so you've probably seen some pictures of some of the merch and we're very very excited about that but thank you to all of our patrons so but a special thank you to our first patrons genesis and lisa m our special special thank you to the nug king lewis h and welcome and thank you to our newest patron Alyssa l um thank you so much for signing up oh Alyssa i sorry i can't tell the difference between an l and an i apparently Anyway, so, uh, but thank you, Alyssa, I, for signing up on Patreon. We greatly uh, appreciate you, uh, and we don't have any reviews to read. So, you know, we love to read reviews. We love to hear what you think and if you're loving our show and just reading those out. So if you like what we do, please leave us five stars on Apple and some kind words, and we'll read it out on the show. If you also leave us a five-star review and a comment on Spotify, we'll also read it out on the show. But you can also leave us, like, if you're listening to this episode and you're like, I didn't really understand this, or what about this? We'll read those out on the show, and we might even answer them there. So if you have that, that's a great way to submit us questions and there on Spotify. And lastly, uh, come hang out with us on Discord. Helps podcasting and more Discord server. Come and hang out. It's the best place on the internet. And that's the last. That's all I got. All right, well, let's get back into it. Abominations are always so awkward at family reunions. Have you ever seen an abomination? They are ugly. Dorian, those words you say, what do they mean? What, you mean like mendicant, ultimatum? No ass when you're mad. Pishanti Kofas. You're swearing, I know it. Vishanta Kafas. It's Tavin, relics of the old tongue. We still use the colorful phrases. And it means what? Literally, you shit on my tongue. <laughs> oh, you fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is bad. 
Okay, so let's talk about the Dalish, um, because we can't talk about an elven god without talking about the people who believe in that said god. So I brought the Dalish story about the origin of Elgernon, his creation myth, etc. I know I teased the very, very basics of it earlier, um, but this is the longer version, and I just I just want to read it. And this is the, the Elgernon Codex also that we talked about during the fun facts. So also this codex, you know how sometimes like their letters or their diary entries or whatever, this one says that it is a tale of Elgernon and the Sun as told by Gisharel, keeper of the Rala Theron clan of the Dalish elves. And also pretty much all of these elven codexes are tales told by Gisharel. So he's a really important elf that you may not have heard of before. Um, do we know roughly like where the Rolla Farron clan like nomads around? I don't think so. I tried to Google it on fandom, but just there's not much. So I, I don't think so. All right. So uh, this is what the codex says. Long ago, when time itself was young, the only things in existence were the sun and the land. The sun, curious about the land, bowed his head close to her body and Elgernon was born in the place where they touched. The sun and the land loved Elgernon greatly, for he was beautiful and clever. As a gift to Elgernon, the land brought forth great birds and beasts of the sky and forest, and all manner of wonderful green things. Elgernon loved his mother's gifts, and praised them highly and walked amongst them often. The sun, looking down upon the fruitful land, saw the joy that Elgernon took in her works and grew jealous. Out of spite, he shone his face full upon all the creatures the earth had created and burned them all to ashes. The land cracked and split from bitterness and pain and cried salt tears for the loss of all she had wrought. The pool of tears cried for the land became the ocean, and the cracks in her body the first rivers and streams. Elgernon was furious at what his father had done and vowed vengeance. He lifted himself into the sky and wrestled the sun, determined to defeat him. They fought for an eternity, and eventually the sun grew weak, while Elgernon's rage was unabated. Eventually, Elgernon threw the sun down from the sky and buried him in a deep abyss created by the land's sorrow. With the sun gone, the world was covered in shadow, and all that remained in the sky were the reminders of Elgernon's battle with his father, drops of the sun's lifeblood, which twinkled and shimmered in the darkness. So, I have some thoughts right off the bat. This is much more than just Elgernon's creation myth. This is a creation myth of the entire world using Elgernon as a main character. This is, we, we're we told, this is how the earth, how Thetis was created with the water and the the seas and the, the rivers and the stars and all the animals and the plant life. Like this is a creation myth for Thetis, not just Elgernon. But also, it's really interesting for me to look at patterns, and I just see a lot of patterns in this, and, and most notably is Elgernon is furious at his father for the way that the son treated the earth, and Elgernon's father, the son, does the exact same thing that Elgernon now does. He burns people to ash. Um, so it's just a really interesting repetition of family trauma if you will yeah uh and i know we're going to get into this later in a discussion but i just want to know like if you're reading this and you're being like this sounds so familiar it's because it is mm -hmm. so similar to the birth of the titans in greek mythology Yes, which we will definitely discuss later. Mm -hmm. um, but some of my takeaways from this codex were, you know, Elgernon was a talented child. He was beloved by both his parents. Um, but most significantly is that because of his hatred for his father, 
Elgernon probably hates that the Dalish associate him with the sun. Like he probably hates that because he hated his father. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a theme that shows up in Dragon Age a lot of these falling short parental figures is the nice way I'm going to put it. Uh, but, you know, we have Hayward. We have the woman who cares for Sarah. We have even like the Hawk siblings and their own parent. Yes, I know Cash is going to come for me. But, you know, each Hawk sibling in all of their things has issues, whether it's with Leandra or if it's with Malcolm. Like there are issues that come up. Leandra and Gate and Gamlin with their own parents. There are issues that come up. These issues of this parental relationship comes up time and time again. Um, really, in my opinion, the only good parents we see are is the dad in the city elf origin and the Kuzlin parents. Yeah, I don't disagree there. And so I just think it's this interesting theme that the that keeps coming up. And part of that is is like a lot of people have issues with their parents. So that's real story that's relatable story writing. And so I think that's probably why they put it in there. Yeah. Well, I, I just think the last thing I wanted to say about this codex, unless you had other takeaways, is that, you know, the Dalish believe this creation myth tells us you know, that, that Elgernon, like he, he buries the sun. Right. And so they believe that, that he does this in quote, the abyss. Um, and some of the sun's heat remained in the earth in Thetis. And so that's what gave rise to the hot springs in the Dales. And the Dalish still call these hot springs pools of the sun because of the association with Elgernon and literally the sun. And so they're really sacred to the Dalish. Um, and you you can find these. You can go to these pools of the sun in Inquisition, and they are in Orlane currently. So, all right. So, so the last uh, mythological fact I have about this specific thing is that the dwarves, according to the Dalish, but still, the dwarves fear the sun supposedly because of Elgernon, at least originally. You seem skeptical. Seems convenient. <laughs> okay. Say it. All right, that's fine. Um, okay, so... My next little segment before we get into just like our general thoughts and takes is in universe thoughts and takes about Elgernon. So the Dalish fear him. Obviously, they fear him. And it's a very slight distinction, but an important one. And they the Dalish use Elgernon's name to invoke curses, but they do not ask Elgernon to deliver justice on their behalf because they know that he would just destroy everything and everyone in his wake, which he has done before, which we also have an example of in a codex. And this one is called Song to Elgernon. And it's actually a song to Elgernon that's found in the Temple to Mithal. We don't know who wrote it, um, but this is what it says. Elgernon, wrath and thunder, give us glory. Give us victory over the earth that shakes our cities. Strike the usurpers with your lightning. Burn the ground under your gaze. Bring winged death against those who throw down our work. Elgernon, help us tame the land. So this codex is thought to be from a time when the ancient elves were pushing the dwarves underground. And so you see in this example, they're not asking for justice. They're asking for victory. Now, Austin, I know you wanted to make a point. So you go right ahead. So two things. The first is to ask Elgernon for victory over the earth, which according to their own lore, he loves and mm -hmm. wants to protect. So giving victory over the earth my second point to this and i think will really get interesting this is really interesting when compared with the pillars of the earth codex 
and just an idea that here we have another two god talking about striking down the earth which we know that pillars of the earth is a common phrase used for the titans and titans are heavily associated with dwarf mythology so maybe there is this battle that's coming in that there really was a battle between the Evaneris and the titans I think that that is likely um, because we have at least two, I think there may be three codex entries that hint toward that. And to me, like, that's a lot. Like anything more than one is no longer a coincidence. Like that is, okay, there's something here. Whether or not it's it's intended or not is beyond the point, but there's something here. And I think that this going back to your first point the interpretation of earth can either be literally the earth or it, it could also be the pillars of the earth the titans so i think if it is referring to the titans and referring to a battle with the dwarves it makes that lore and accuracy less of an inaccuracy correct um and i just want to say there's an old rabbinical saying about one time is happenstance twice is coincidence but three times is the will of god yeah um and so it's our brains like things in threes I, I yes i would just add when it comes to bioware once is something to watch out for twice is an act of the developers three times is the developers waving a red flag at us saying hey you idiot look at this uh-huh uh and then my last point is the last the second to last phrase or stanza bring winged death there is only one thing that anyone in any fantasy world ever associates with winged death and that is a dragon I think it points to this idea. There's this connection, and I know we're getting into this, and but like this connection across Thetis of associating deities with dragons. Like we know that Plymouth learns her shape shifting into a dragon because she's bonded with Mithal, the spirit of Mithal. And I think that that's relevant in the fact that Morrigan can't do it unless she bathes in the well of sorrows. Yes. And I mean, I, I kind of think this winged death line could potentially even just be referring to Mythal. Mm, that's also possible. But it's just really interesting. I think the biggest interesting point here is the connection to the pillars of the earth, Codex Entry, and this idea of striking down the Titans. There's just a lot of implications on why a war with the Titans was a bad idea, and maybe the killing of this Titan is what causes the eventual death of Mythal and betrayal by Finn Harrell. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of speculation when, that we just don't mm -hmm. know. We just don't know. There's so much we don't know. Um, but I, honestly, at this point, like I, I just make it a habit to not rule anything out. Um, but I do want to transition us a little bit to just kind of provide some basic general overview, thoughts and reflections that you have about Elgernon. I just have one main point and it's that I, I really feel like he has so many similarities with Zeus. He overthrows and defeats his father. He fights with Titans. He has an association with the sun and he's vengeful. I, I feel like that is a really, that Zeus is a really big inspiration here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we have little differences. like, But I think it's really interesting in this creation myth. So in Greek mythology, the Titans are born when Uranus and Gaia meet. The sky and the earth meet. And their meeting brings forth the Titan. And then the Titans obviously give birth to the gods. But it's, the, it's through the meeting of these two very primal gods. And that's really what we're looking for. Like, we don't have names for them, but it's like, Entities. And I think here we get a lot of like comparison to Native American mythology in creation, because oftentimes they won't give a name to it, but they will just talk about like the spirit of the sun or the spirit of the earth or 
a great spirit that exists in all nature. Uh, and that's a very generalization. Each of the hundreds of Native American tribes in the continent has a known different creation myth with its own thing. So it's hard to make general statements. I think where the replication with Zeus really stops, though, is Elkernon seems to care more about his, about the creation than Zeus does. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that goes back to like Elkernon is compassionate. And I think it goes back to like this idea of justice and vengeance kind of being two sides of the same coin. And like he cares so much about the beauty that the earth brought forth to him, the creatures on the world and everything that it leads him to go against his father. There is a sense of justice or righting a wrong with both of those characters going after their father. Yeah. And I also think the, the statement you made about um, that he is compassionate is something that sticks out to me because at, at first glance, you would anybody who just like briefly thought looked through this would say no austin teacup you're insane but i think you're right because from the creation myth like his vengeance his fury his rage comes from his compassion for his mother and for the land and so i think when you have someone when you have a person who has experienced you know maybe a lot of injustice in their life and then that there's like this one thing that finally breaks them like this story begins to make a little bit more sense. Um, And so I I do think that you're right in that and that his vengeance is not just from a place of like wanting to be angry, wanting to be a nightmare to everyone. It's coming from a place of like, oh, my mother, my mother was hurt by my father. My father hurt her. And so I think that for Elgernon, and this may be a little bit of a speculation, but I think that he's probably enraged by injustice and granted uh, the Evanuris definitely do perpetuate a lot of injustice. um, But as they are gods, they tend to have a different perspective on what injustice really is. So it's complicated would be my, my final closing thought there. And so I think it, it is complicated, but I think it's interesting because this idea of like, caring for the world and the earth and creation is present in both of the supposed Evanuris that we meet in universe. Because Flemeth, like one of the first things Flemeth says, you can ask her in Origins, like, why do you care about the blight at all? Like, or this, and she goes, I don't want the world to end. I like this world. I care about this world. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see it consumed by a blight. And Solus, as problematic as he is, is coming from a place where I think in his own twisted way, he cares about the world and the state that it is in. Yeah, he um, just doesn't care about humans. Mm-hmm. And so I think that we get this point of like, maybe if we lean into are they actually parents Maybe these were ideals that they instilled in their children. But it's just interesting to me, like Elgernon, he has this overarching umbrella that the other Evanuris kind of latch on to. Like he cares about the creatures and the earth, kind of like Andriel and Gilanon do. And just all kinds of other stuff that when the other Evanuris come on the scene, like they also care about those. Mm -hmm. I think Elgernon is really compelling for me personally because I find myself becoming furious on occasion at injustice and other things. So I I do kind of um, like Elgernon personally, um, but I do think that Elgernon is one of the ones we know the most about, him and Mithal. Um, So I, I, I know that there are a lot of fan theories out there, but every time we go into fan theories, People get mad at us and they're like, this isn't accurate. And I'm like, yeah, it's a fan theory. It's not accurate. There's not stuff to back it up. So we're just not going to talk about fan theories with the gods because it can get really confusing really quickly. Um, we will mention stuff like obviously interpretations of codexes and stuff, but we we do not have a fan theory segment um, in this season. So we're going to kind of wrap up Elgernon unless Austin you have any final closing thoughts nope I do not all right well something else that I'm doing that's fun for this season is I'm trying to make and it's not always going to work but I'm trying to find side characters 
-hmm. who really display at least one of the characteristics of whatever God we're talking about that day. And so today we're talking about Shiani, who is a city elf that you meet in the city elf origin in Dragon Age Origins. She's a cousin of the city elf, Hero of Ferelden, and I think she perfectly exemplifies Elgernon's compassionately motivated vengeance. So let's get into it. So, background. Um, Shiani was actually not born in the Denerim alienage. She was instead born in a free elven sector of Denerim, which I did not know that existed before I did this research. But her mother did pass away when she was only six years old, which is when her uncle, Syrian Tabris, the father of the hero of Ferelden City Elf, came to take care of her and bring her back to the alienage. Shiani mourned her mother and dreamed often of her father returning to take care of her. She always imagined him as a Dalish warrior who would whisk her away to become one of the true elves, a.k.a. the Dalish. When she first moved to the alienage, her uncle Syrian gave her a stuffed Mabari toy that originally belonged to the hero of Ferelden. Over time, however, she did begin to plant or did begin to accept and even came to love the alienage. She also came to greatly respect the leader, Haran Valindrian, who initially scared her. When Shiani grew up into a teenager, she absolutely did not want to get married, and so a suitable spouse was never found for her. She poured most of her time into serving the elves of the alienage and even from a young age was inspired and both infuriated by the injustice and squalor of the alienage. So that's kind of her background, but we're going to get into where we see her in Origins. And I do just want to issue a trigger warning uh, because we are going to talk about sexual assault, sexual abuse, um, those things as that is a main plot point in the city elf origin. So if that's something that may trigger you, um, just turn the episode off. It's okay. So when you first begin origins as a city elf, Shiani is the one that wakes you up in the morning because it's your wedding day. She's like your best friend, your cousin. She's there to help you get ready. Um, you do see her shortly thereafter getting into trouble with the son of the Arl of Denerim. His name is Vaughn. Shiani is just being herself, which is generally feisty, sassy, and intolerant of injustice. Uh, at which point she then hits Vaughn with a wine bottle. And in retaliation, Vaughn and his cronies later on disrupt the hero of Ferelden's wedding and kidnap all of the women present, including Shiani and the hero of Ferelden. We don't necessarily see exactly what happens, but the implication is that Vaughn and all of his friends, they're there to rape and torture Shiani, the hero of Ferelden, and all of the other women, and probably murder them at the end, too. This assault is later confirmed um, when you meet King Kalen, or at least it can be, one of the dialogue options uh, when Kaylin asks about the alienage is, quote, I killed an Arl's son for raping my friend. So I would say that's pretty much confirmed. Now, interestingly enough, which I hate this, but interestingly enough, the hero of Ferelden does have the choice to take a bribe from Vaughn of 40 gold and leave Shiani in his care. Uh, I personally have never and will never do that, um, but you can do it. It is an option. The other option is to kill Vaughn and his cronies, freeing Shiani and the rest of the women. This obviously causes issues in the alienage. Um, but if, on the other hand, if you take Vaughn's bribe, that's going to cause issues with your relationship with Shiani as the hero of Ferelden. So I just always forget how evil you can be in Origins. Yeah, same. And not just evil, but like despicable. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the origin. Um, we don't see Shiani again until you've completed at least one of the big three uh, or big four quests of origins. You can encounter her when you go to um, the gauntlet as part of the test of faith quests to get the urn of sacred ash. 
it's not really Shiani. It's it's like a ghost or a spirit of Shiani. Um, and so, you know, we know what this is like. But the city elf hero of Ferelden is asked if they think they failed Shiani. And you can you can answer however you want. Um, but then we do actually meet Shiani again in in the flesh um, during the unrest in the alienage quest, which is when the hero of Ferelden goes to the alienage to investigate a mysterious plague that is actually a Tevinter plot to enslave as many of the elves as possible. Now, if you do this quest as a human, Shiani's um, her viewpoint toward you is so interesting because it changes drastically. If you're a human, she is straight up aggressive and downright untrusting towards you. Like she does not like you, wants you to know it and will not trust the thing you say. However, uh, if you're a dwarf, she's not quite aggressive. She just says, you don't belong here. And then if you are playing a city elf hero of Ferelden, she will mention your wedding. And if you did not take Vaughn's bribe, she's very happy to see you. Um, if you did accept the bribe, she's furious, quote, that you have the nerve to return to the alienage. And then she treats you in that case as nothing more than a nuisance that she has to deal with. Now, if you do take the bribe, but you also had freed Soros from the Arl of Dinnerum's estate, she is a little bit nicer to you. Uh, but the best thing is to free him. Don't take the bribe. You know, do all the, the good things to the elves. And she's happy to see you. Um, but it's really interesting to see Shiani again. And I watched um, some of the, the videos that you can find on YouTube in preparation because She's one of the very few people from the alienage who actually suspects that foul play is going on. Most of the people are like, yeah, I don't know why there's this plague. I, I don't know. And she's like, no, there's something that doesn't add up. So not only is she, you know, intolerant of injustice, sassy and feisty, she's also very intelligent, too. Um at the start of the Defend the Alienage quest during the final battles against the Darkspawn and Denerim, Shiani can be encountered along with a few other elves. She will then warn the Warden that there is a large group of Darkspawn arriving and that the gates are not going to hold. And so she's asking for your help. And so you can attempt to persuade Shiani to help in fighting the Darkspawn or you can ask her to flee and keep out of the way. Um, as a thanks for defending the alienage, she gifts the warden the dawn ring. And then lastly about Shiani is in the epilogue, a city elf hero of Ferelden can name Shiani as the first ban of Denerim's alienage. And so regardless of whether or not she becomes the ban, she does become the Haren or the leader of the alienage after the battle of Denerim. So Shiani does come to a position of leadership, no matter what choices you make. So that's, that's really significant. And then I just have two quotes that I think really sum her up. And the first one is just a lovely flowery, sweet, um, loving quote that is touch me and I'll gut you, you pig. Lovely. And then the second one is when she's speaking to other elves during unrest in the alienage. She says, didn't the wedding teach you people anything? Nobody is coming here to help us. We have to help ourselves, which I think is a really um, wise view to take. If not, um, she's, she's very much a go-getter. Like she does not care what the humans think of her. And frankly, I just have to respect that. So, that is Shiani. I think that she's a great example of Elgernon's vengeance in a side character. What are your thoughts about this one? I think I would tend to agree with that, especially in the like, I feel like Elgernon, given that he does take stuff into his own hand, would say like, nobody's coming here to help us. We have mm -hmm. to do this. It's no one but us. One thing that like Elgernon that I've noticed this time in the research is generally and Shiani is Elgernon is a leader. Like whether or not we see him leading the Evanuris or not in the stories we talked about, like he exhibits qualities of a leader, 
of doing what needs to be done and helping others to establish the same. And Shiani is absolutely that. I think she's a great character. Um, I think she not only is a character of vengeance and stuff, but also of resilience. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that about her. Yeah, and I I, I have used her as an example of like Elgernon's uh, vengeance, but that's not the only thing about Shiani that's significant. I think I completely agree with you. She's got this leadership potential. Um, She's so smart. She is wise, even if she sometimes acts in a way that may not be the most wise decision. But I think that she's thinking about it and it's like, nah, it's worth it. Um, And I respect that. But that's all I have about Elgernon and Shiani. So unless you have any um, final thoughts, we can wrap it up. Uh, No, I don't think so. Um, But thanks for bringing all this stuff. I really enjoyed our conversation on Elgernon and Shiani. And I always love talking about the elf lore. And But before we go, I have a special thank you to our Nug King patron, Louis H. Thank you all for listening to the Dragon Age lore cast. We will see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. You can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, join our Cups Podcasting and More Discord server. It's easily the best place on the internet. You can also support us financially through our Patreon. You can find us there on patreon.com slash dragonagelorecast. The Dragon Age Lorecast is part of the Robots Radio Network. For more information about the Robots Radio Network, join the Discord server via the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed the show or learned something new today, please subscribe, leave us a review, and join the Patreon. And if you enjoyed our intro and outro music, give a big thank you to Pipe Man Studios. Thank you, Pipe Man. Thanks again for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Aaron. And I'm Ariel. And we're the hosts of the Legend of Zelda Lorecast, a podcast about all things Legend of Zelda, from Errol to Zora, and all the fun things in between. If you're ready to dive deep and learn more about the Legend of Zelda lore and everything surrounding it, come join us on Legend of Zelda Lorecast. You can find us on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Google, or wherever else you get your podcasts. We hope to see you soon.